And it's sometimes just the little things that they may do. Last week, Alex New was visiting us, and he sat back there where uh, um, Kelly and is sitting right behind the Schaefer's. I don't know if you got to meet him, but um, I draw attention to him because his father's Willis New. And when I was going to University of Oregon in my freshman year, it was a trying time, first time away from home. And it was easy to come up with excuses not to continue to honor God and worship him. And if it wasn't for the little things that Willis did and his girlfriend, Marcia, now they're married, he would come by every Sunday and pick me up out of the dorms and take me to services. And there were times that I was not even awake. He would on the window outside my rooms. Jack, let's go. And it was a little difference that he made in my life is perhaps why I'm standing here today. And so we can do amazing things for people's life just by little acts of kindness like that. And that's really what we want to talk about this morning as we look at a miracle in the life of Jesus when he raised the widow's son. Now, when we think about miracles in the Bible, there are many things that, uh, that just stand out. I don't know what your favorite one is. I don't know if it's uh, feeding the 5,000 or giving sight to the blind. Can you imagine seeing for the very first time in your life? Or having uh, the lame man walk. You know, all these, we, it's easy to see the initial benefit. But perhaps it's more difficult to uh, see the real uh, spiritual lesson that is taught. That's why I like that song, Close My Eyes, so that I can see. Because sometimes we got to not look at just the obvious physical, yeah, walking again, that would be great. But there's something behind these miracles that Jesus is trying to teach us. And we even commented in our morning class about how they're called miracles, signs, and wonders. So we liken it going to, say, go to National Park if you went to Yellowstone. And you say, well, oh, I heard you went to Yellowstone. Yeah, here's a picture right in front of the, the front gate, Yellowstone National Park. And I said, well, wow, what do you think about the uh, Old Faithful? Never saw it. Well, how about all the buffalo? Never looked at them. Well, what do you mean? How could you miss them? Well, we just went to the sign, and we took our picture and came back. He said, what? You didn't even enter the park? Well, I thought we were at Yellowstone. We got there. The sign said Yellowstone National Park, and we go, well, that's nice, and we came back. And we say, oh, no, no, no. The sign just points you to the place inside, and that's where it's really happening, isn't it? That's where the beauty and the awe of God's creation is on display. You just saw the sign. Likewise, healing the blind, feeding the 5,000, there's an initial benefit, but it's the lesson behind it that we have to look a little deeper to see. There are three people, uh, occasions, that Jesus rose someone from the dead. And I got him totally messed up in class this morning. So let's correct it for the record. First, it was Jairus' daughter. And she had just died. She was still in the room and they were mourning over her. And then we find Lazarus, who is already dead and in the grave for four days. And the third one is the one we want to talk about. It's found in Luke chapter 7. So I really open your Bibles and invite you to do that. So you can read this for yourself. This is man has died, he's not yet buried, but he's on the way to the grave. So it doesn't matter how long you've been dead to Jesus. He can reanimate the physical body and bring you back to life. And that's exactly what we're going to see in this case, as we see how Jesus has this compassion for this woman of Nain who is a widow. And we can see the compassionate difference that he makes in her life. And we're trying to illustrate that as we look at this account. But in raising her son, we learn a lesson for ourselves. That if we're actively compassionate ourselves, we can save souls from death. You go, whoa, whoa what do you mean? Save souls from death. Exactly just that. Maybe not physical death. But the most important death, and that'd be spiritual. So we're going to look at the actual miracle. 
Then we'll take time and look at how to be actively compassionate in ourselves. And then we're going to look at the greater things we can do because that's the promise that Jesus gave to his disciples. Yeah, I've done some great miracles, but you'll be doing greater things. What do you mean by that, Lord? We want to see that by being actively compassionate, again, we can do greater things. We can save souls from spiritual death. Let's look at this account, and I thank Dave for reading it uh, for us as we began uh, our worship. But it's just a short an account, this miracle. And uh, there's this city called Nain. It's a little village, and Jesus is marching to it. He's just healed a centurion servant early in the chapter. And we know this person was sick and about to die, so I want you to see it. He's about to die, and he saved him from death. Now, while he's going to Nain, this little village, this widow's son, her only son, has already died. He's too late. And so that's where we pick up our reading in verse 11. He went to the city called Nain, and the disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a great multitude, a large multitude of people. Now, that's what we have to understand. This crowd is excited. They're passionate. They've never seen such great acts of God in their life. You know, just the last one they experienced was the healing of the centurion servant. You know, no one spoke like Jesus spoke. And when it said a large crowd, I can only imagine how big it was. Probably, perhaps much larger than this crowd itself. So it's a really just a procession, isn't it? Marching to this city, and they're all just so taken by Jesus, they want to walk with him and listen to him and see what he's going to do next. It's full of life. And then we notice, coming out of the city, the contrast. As he approached the gate of the city, verse 12, behold, a dead man was being carried out, being carried out. The only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a sizable crowd from the city was with her. See the contrast? Jesus is going. Does he have a large crowd with him? And who does he come in a collision course with? Death. Here he's bringing a crowd that is full of life. And here is a crowd of large, considerable number. It's a funeral procession. And they're bringing out a dead person to be buried outside the city name. Archaeologists have found the ruins of such a cemetery. No doubt her husband was buried there himself. Life meets death. Now, the custom of that day, I've been told, was when you came across a Jewish funeral procession, you were obliged to join in with it. Because you're going to grieve with those that grieve and mourn with those that mourn. And no doubt there would often be professional wailers. And people would mourn and be crying out loud. It, it would be a moving event to, to see this person be carried along. Now, it would not be in a casket. It would be more like a litter, you know, like a stretcher. It would probably be made out of wicker. And the body's laid on it and draped over with something. But... It's not like you would imagine today, certainly not a hearse or in any type of, they're being carried on, on, a, on a, a platform. And so here this collision course between life and death, what's going to happen? Well, we find this verse 13, the Lord saw her. That's very interesting. He saw her. And he felt compassion for her, and then he said to her, do not weep. Now, when he says, do not weep, he's just not giving words that are trifle and just trying to console her. But actually, those words are, if, are kind of rude in themselves, aren't they? I mean, her only son has died, and someone says, what are you crying about? Stop weeping. If, if that was the extent of his word, they're kind of insensitive, aren't they? Stop weeping. They're only meaningful is because Jesus intends to do something about his compassion. And that's what I want to, to impress upon us. There's one thing to feel sorry for people. It's there's one thing to feel some type of emotional pain. There's another thing to have compassion. 
This word means to me, move from the bowels with a desire to do something about it. You're so moved by the plight of another that you're going to act on their behalf. And that's why he says, don't weep. Because Jesus knows in his mind and heart what he's going to do for her. I'm going to turn your weeping into joy. Now, no one else knows that, but Jesus does. And he speaks because he's moved by compassion. If that's one thing that marks the life of our Lord and Savior and who he is right now, he is a God of compassion. He cares like nobody else cares. He understands like no one else understands. And literally, you have to understand, he's moved with our anguish and our pain. It moves him as well. And that's why we can run to him in the time of need, the Hebrew writer says, to the throne of grace. And he will come and answer our cry. That's the kind of Lord and God that we serve. So he says, do not weep. And that's what I want you to see he acts. Every uh, one of the resurrections, he just speaks the word. Lazarus, come forth. The girl, he touches her, but he says, rise. And she rose. And it, the same is here. It's just a word. He stops the funeral procession. Now, wouldn't that be kind of awkward to start with? I mean, here they're going to bury this person, and he stops them. Like, what are you doing? Can you imagine st uh, stopping a funeral procession to the, the graveside, you know, flagging down the police and stopping the hearse and say, stop, stop. They think you're crazy. He does this. He says, don't weep. And he speaks to the young man as though he's already alive. He says, young man, I say to you, rise up. And then immediately the dead man sits up. Now, I can't imagine. They probably dropped him. I hope they already put the litter down. <laughs> Wouldn't you? And can you imagine the fear? Because it says fear gripped them all. I know it was real genuine fear. And he rose up and immediately started speaking. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but I didn't want to know what he said. <laughs> don't you? What did he say? Did he say, thank you? And he said, oh, you got any food? Or like, where are you guys going? I don't know what he said. But I want to know. Because Mar or Luke leaves us that information. It's pertinent. It just shows that he's actually what? Alive. And then here's the compassionate thing. He gives the young man to his mother. Isn't that what it says? He takes care of the pain that's in his heart. See, she already lost her husband. And widow in that day is, was more vulnerable than widows today. They didn't have Uncle Sam to take care of them. There was no retirements. They did not have their husband to, to provide things. And so they were really left totally on their own to fend for themselves. Luckily, she has a young adult, a, a son. And now he has died, and she's really, truly left destitute on top of grieving the loss of both her husband and now her only son. And so I hope you're touched by those words that Luke includes this, and he gave her him to his mother. What a grand reunion that must have been. Now, there's the story. Now, if we just stop here and go home, well, that's touching. That's why I just love reading the Bible. It's like going to Yosemite Park and looking at the gate and turning it around. Because it's, there's a lesson to be taught here. Because God is not so much interested in healing the blind and giving them sight or feeding the 5,000 or giving you a, a, a life to a dead person because this person is going to die again, right? He's not going to live forever. Lazarus died again. So did Jairus' daughter. And, and this young man is going to die again someday. See, Jesus is more interested in something eternal, longer lasting, and that would be the eternal resurrection. And that's really what he's showing and teaching us as we look behind the scene that if we're going to be actively passionate, we have to understand Jesus has the power to give life, doesn't he? And, and he's one that he says in John chapter 5, as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, also the Son of Man gives life to the whom as well. And he, he even speaks about his own body. He says, you know, kill this body in three days. I will raise it up. He has the power to give life. 
And with that, he's passionate about doing so. We're all very mindful at Lazarus' resurrection that he wept over his death. Now, this wasn't just for show, obviously. It was a spontaneous, natural weeping because he hurt. Because from the very beginning, when Adam first sinned, sin has now spread to all men and death has spread to all people. It wasn't intended that way initially. And when God uh, in the flesh, Jesus, sees his good friend Lazarus is now another victim, of this thing we call death, he weeps. It's genuine. He understands what it's like. But he has the power to give life. Now, it's interesting in Luke chapter 9 and in a couple more uh, uh, chapters, we're going to come back and look at this. I just want to introduce to it. There are some people that are so taken by Jesus, said, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you want to go. Where are you going? He said, well, the foxes have holes, and but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his his head. So you sure you want to follow me? And then one man says, Master or Lord, let me go bury my father first, and then I'll follow you. And that's where Jesus says this statement, and it seems to be actually kind of cruel at first. Let the dead bury the dead. You come follow me. What do you mean? Short circuit that process, not allow someone to grieve? Now, and this is where we have to understand the culture of the day. This is an Aramaic idiom where it's basically a statement that, that talks about a person that's hanging around waiting for their folks to die. They're not dead yet or near death. They're just saying, you know, I can't go do this because my dad's getting older and I don't know how long he's going to last, so i got to be here for him and, and uh, I'd love to go with you, Lord, but i got to stay here and when dad dies and we can clean up the estate, then I'll come forward. Do you understand the difference? He's not being rude. Let the dead bury the dead. He's saying, you know, there's always going to be a reason not to follow me. But I want you to notice here, he calls the living the dead, doesn't he? Let the dead bury the dead. See, they're physically alive but they're spiritually separated from God, and we call that spiritual death. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul says, even though when you were dead in your sin and trespasses, he says that sin that entered our life, that was passed on him because we have all sinned in the likeness of Adam, has separated us from God. And he said, even though you were dead in sin, verse 4, he said, God has made you alive in Christ and seated you at his right hand. And he's raised you up. He uses that word resurrection. <clears throat> See, Jesus has the power to raise people even from spiritual death. And that's what he's most passionate about. Not just a physical resurrection that you're doomed to die again, but if a spiritual resurrection that'll, that will last forever. And that's why in John chapter 6, we won't take the time, but he says, I offer life to everyone who wants to eat of my flesh. The true bread of life. They didn't understand this, and many of the disciples withdrew from him because that statement was so hard. But when it does happen, Someone is spiritually raised. You just got to rejoice. Just like when this widow's son was raised from the dead, we see the response was fear gripped them all, but then they glorified God. He says, someone great, a prophet has visited us. No doubt they thought of Elijah who raised a widow's son from the death as well. Jesus has come in his likeness, but it's not just raising us physically. They said, God has truly visited us. The word visit isn't just like, hi, what you got to eat? When God visits someone, he brings his blessings and deliverance upon you. That's what that word invokes, that type of idea. They're saying, God, God has visited us. God has visited us. And so Jesus, he's so passionate about spiritual life and spiritual death that he wants to do something about it. He has the power to do something about it. And so Luke 15, he gives the parable or the story of this uh, young man we call the prodigal son. 
He demanded from his father, give me my share of the state. And the man had to turn, you know, uh, livestock and property into cash. And he gave it to him. And the guy went and squandered it. And we know the story. It says he came to his senses. And he comes back to the father said, I'm not going to be worthy to be your son. Just make me a slave. That was his plan. So he heads back and his father sees him coming from the distance, implying that he's been looking for his son's return all the time. When he sees him coming, he recognizes his walk or something, and he realizes, it's my son. He goes and runs to him and embraces him and kisses him. Throws a big party. There's this huge celebration. A fatted Catholic was very extravagant at that day. Could have fed the whole village. But he's just so excited. And his older brother comes in, and you know how it was. He's upset. He didn't even call him father. He said, this son of yours... You know, I've always obeyed you. I've ever done everything you asked me to do. But this son of yours, after he's lived with prostitutes and squandered all his money, you killed the fatted calf, and you've never done that for me. He's mad. No compassion. And that's where the father says this. <laughs> son, son. We had to celebrate. Well, why? We had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother's years was dead. Dead. Physically alive. Maybe near death because he wants to eat pig's food. Starving. But he's physically alive but spiritually what? Dead to his father. He was dead and has begun to live, was lost, and now has been found. And Jesus gives us account to illustrate God's passionate love for everyone that's dead in sin. He would do anything to win us back. And then when one soul comes back, there's just great rejoicing in heaven. The difference one person can make is astounding. And that's where he says then, finally, we can do greater things. And when uh, going back to the resurrection of Lazarus, Mary runs out to him. God, God bless. Mary because she has a lot of faith it was like we studied in Mark class she sees but she doesn't see right she gets part of it but she doesn't see the whole picture and so she comes to him and says you know master if you had been here in time he wouldn't have died does she express faith in Jesus <laughs> of course she knows if you would have caught here on time you could have healed him from his sickness he never would have died but where were you it's almost like chiding what took so long and that's where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, any person will live even if they do die. Then he goes on to say, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die spiritually. And then he asks a simple question. Do you believe this? Do you believe it? And I have to respond, yes, I believe, Lord. Help me in my unbelief. Yeah, I believe it, but help me in my unbelief where I begin to doubt. And then I'm going to follow this now in John 14. He's speaking specifically to his disciples that he's chosen, who he's empowered to do miracles. So I understand the context. But notice what he says. He says, truly I say to you, he who believes in me, that seems very generic, the works that I do, he will also do. And greater works than these, he will do, because I'm going to my father. Greater than the Jesus has done. What could be greater than raising the dead or feeding 5,000 or casting out demons? The answer should be obvious. It's giving spiritual life to someone who's spiritually dead. Wouldn't that be a greater work? Because it has eternal benefits and consequences. And I would suggest that's what he's asking us and he's saying we can do. There's this call that God is making for all of us to be compassionate actively in the lives of those around us. Yes, help them physically. Yes, help them when they're sick. Yes, you know, feed them. But there's something that trumps all that. And it's bringing them to Jesus Christ so he can raise them from their spiritual death. Doesn't that trump everything? Isn't that the greatest gift that we could give anyone? And that's what the call is for all of us. In Luke chapter 9, remember when he said, let the dead bury their own dead? 
He said, here's what I want you to do. You go out and preach the kingdom. See, so they're already spiritually dead. You get to change that. You can bring life to the walking dead. They're spiritually dead, aren't they? And you can bring life to them by preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. So that's what I want you to do. Now, this guy is like a lot of us. We have all the reasons in the world not to do it. There's always something that comes up that we'll use as a reason or an excuse. And we're trying to be pragmatic, I understand, to not be busy following Christ in this realm. And trust me, I know, because every time you get one thing taken care of, up pops another. And Satan will fill our life full of distractions so we never get busy doing the most important thing, the greater work. Not that the other things are bad. This is just the greater work. And so that's what he says. Let the dead bury the dead. He's not trying to be rude, but he's trying to get us to establish priorities. I can't raise anyone, but Christ can. And by sharing that news or sharing him or bringing those people to Christ, he has the opportunity to raise them from the dead spiritually. And so that's why James says this. If I just turn one person back, James chapter 5, it'll be our last passage. And James is so practical in his letter. The brother of Jesus who didn't believe in him at all. And we know that one thing that changed James mind about his brother was the resurrection he was there and he saw him Jesus appeared to him and he now is with the 12 and the rest of the, the disciples in Acts chapter 1 so he writes this letter it's about an active compassionate loving faith one that's not just verbal but one that is seen in all our life and everything we do and he said my brethren if anyone strays from among you from the truth so here he's talking about our christian brother or sister and satan gets a hold of them and distracts them and they're off they go if someone turns him back now how are you going to turn him back jesus saw the woman and he felt compassion we have to have our eyes open we have to have our antennas up, and we have to be looking for opportunity. Because it's so easy to go to our life with our head down because we're so busy and distracted with all things. We don't see what's really going around us, the bigger picture. So, Lord, open my eyes. Open my eyes to the real opportunities that are around me. And give me the courage to go after those people that are straying. Isn't that what he says? He says, if you see someone... And you go to him and turn him back. You have to actually go to the person if you're going to try to turn them back. Notice what he says then. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the air of his way will save his soul from death. Isn't that exciting? I mean, what one of us would not try to save someone that was in a car accident? Just last week, they were pulling this person who was rear-ended, and their car exploded on fire, and they barely got them out, and they still had burns on their body. And what do we call them when we put them on the news? They're heroes. Well, they were. They, they you know, risked their own life to save someone. We would all do that in a moment's notice, but there's something greater than that, and that's spiritual life that we can bring to someone by saving their soul from death by sharing Christ with them. And then he says, you will cover a multitude of sins. Now, we could take this verse and break it down and try to explain what it means in its bigger picture. But the point I just want to share with you is we have such great opportunities here. Jesus has the power to raise someone from the dead spiritually. There will be a general resurrection in everyone's body someday, but those who were raised unrighteous, they're going to go into a place of torment forever. But those who have been raised and lived righteous life, their bodies, they'll be given new spiritual bodies. They'll live with Jesus forever. And so the difference is made right now. And that's why, again, we still have these welcome cards. And then I hope you still have them. They're in the back. Just grab one and, and, and share it with people and just invite them. You know, why don't you come worship with us? That's all you have to do sometimes, just to take part in this greater work, raising someone's soul from the dead.
And then as we get more skilled, we're going to be able to equip ourselves to actually share Christ in 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 an easy way. And we're going to try to have classes this spring about how to teach the gospel in an hour and maybe in five hours or just different methods so you can arm yourselves with just different ways you can just share Jesus. Because really, that's what he came to do, to seek and to save the lost. So again, I encourage you, we've we've been doing this, and it's been effective. Let's not stop. When you go to the bank teller and you do the drive-thru and you hand them your bank book or your statement, give them a card. And they'll go, oh, what's this? Oh, thank you. Uh, No one will ever curse and swear, generally. They might rip it up later, but people are generally nice. You go ahead and just do whatever you can to try to turn a soul from the error of their ways. Those who are actively compassionate are able to save souls from death, and that includes you and me. So let's continue in this process. And I guess the question is, really, do you believe this? Just like Mary was asked, do you believe this? Because if we believe like Mary was asked, and we really believe that Jesus can raise people from the dead spiritually, and we can take part in that process, we'll be active in it. So I'm asking you all, look, do you believe that God's asking you to do it? Do you believe that he's going to give you opportunity to do it? If we just continue to open our eyes and see, amazing things will happen in our lives. Let me just speak finally to those who are not in Christ. If you're with us and you're not a child of God, you know, it's not that you're not trying to live a good life. I don't know what's going on with you, but sin is like a spiritual cancer. And once you get sin in your life, you will die eternally from separated from God. And the only way to be cured of that spiritual cancer is to get it cut out, to get rid of it. And the only way that's possible is to come to Jesus. He died for those sins. And he said, if you are buried with me in the waters of baptism, I'll wash all those sins away as as if they never happened ever, and you'll never remember them ever again. He won't, excuse me. And it's just that simple. He loves us so much, and he, he's so passionate about that. It would be a miss if we didn't offer you the opportunity to do something right now. If you need to study more and you need to want to have a personal class, we're here to do that as well. Then finally, to our own members, there's a time maybe that you need to just rededicate yourself to the Lord. You've got something you're struggling with personally. Talk to the elders. Talk to me privately. But if you need the prayers of the congregation, Brian's going to come forward right now. We're going to sing this song. We sing it not just to close so we can go home and eat. We sing this song to encourage you. Won't you stand as we sing together? <laughs>